Bé, Stephen Downs és canadenc, va néixer al Quebec a Montreal i és especialista en aprenentatge en línia i en nous mitjans. És un expert internacional que treballa pel Consell Nacional d'Investigació de Canadà, on és investigador sènior des de l'any 2001 i està adscrit al grup d'aprenentatge i tecnologies col·laboratives de l'Institut de Tecnologia de la Informació. Ha publicat nombrosos articles sobre e-learning 2.0 i publica un bolletí electrònic diari, que es diu el Daily, i que es distribueix entre milers de subscriptors de molts països del món. L'any 2005, el seu blog, que es diu també All Daily, va guanyar un premi al blog individual dels premis EduBlog, i ell és un popular orador, és professor, de formació és filòsof, i ha treballat també en temes d'arquitectura de la informació, és especialista en educació a distància i en nous mitjans. Downs ha escrit extensament sobre una teoria que és el connectivisme, i una teoria que ell mateix resumeix com la teoria en què l'aprenentatge consisteix a fer les connexions correctes. El mes de juliol ja vam tenir l'oportunitat de sentir-lo parlar, però per videoconferència, i avui tenim la gran oportunitat, i a més estem molt contents, de tenir Stephen Downs aquí en persona. Ens parlarà de noves maneres d'aprendre i treballar en la societat xarxa, i específicament ens explicarà què són els entorns personals d'aprenentatge, amb exemples internacionals, un tema interessant que ben segur ens interessarà tot el programa compartint. We are very privileged to have an international expert such as Stephen Downs at the Center of Legal Studies and Specialized Training. Your view on online learning and new media will be very inspiring for the knowledge management program held by the Department of Justice. We are very pleased to present Mr. Stephen Down. Welcome and thank you. Thank you very much. And it's a, it's a pleasure to be here. I don't have a lot of time, but I hope to use the time productively. I see people wincing. Okay. Uh, what I'd like to do to begin with is, well, what I will do today, there we go is talk about the course that was prepared by myself and George Siemens and offered online called Connectivism and Connective Knowledge. This course is an instantiation of the theory of connectivism or as I sometimes say of personal learning that we are using to support online learning. Now let me begin with a bit of a prologue. It's very easy to teach people. I, I, I know that may sound like a heresy, but it is very easy to teach people. But we do it all the time. Our societies have been doing it from history. We can teach people how to count, we can teach people how to speak the language, we can teach people mathematics and the rest. What it turns out to be very hard to do is to teach people the right things, not just sets of facts, but how not to learn, how not to be swayed, how not to simply accept what they're told, to learn, as we say sometimes, from the environment. Let me talk briefly about what I do in my work. I produce a newsletter called OL Day. It stands for Online Learning Dailies. Here it is on my, on my website. That's it calling on the phone. <laughs> what I do is every day I present a series of links, of posts, of transcripts of my talks, of photographs sometimes. Over the years, I have produced some 16,000 different posts. I've been doing this for a while. The posts aren't long, they're short, but they're informative and especially they refer to specific content, specific objects that have been created by people around the world. Now what does 16,000 posts look like? Links, there's topics, there's publications, there's feeds, comments, social networks, but most of all, my observation over the years is that what we see is chaos. 
And I mean that literally, literally chaos. I want to draw a distinction here. Because we think of the internet, we think of advanced studies, we think of things that are complicated, that are difficult to understand, that are made up of many parts. But if we could just understand the parts, then we would understand the whole. But chaos is something more. Things that are complex is something more. In a thing that is complex, it is not simply made up of many parts, it is made up of many parts that interact with each other. This connection <coughs> proves to be critically important because the connection means we cannot simply understand the whole by understanding the parts. There is this thesis. You've probably heard of this thesis. If a butterfly flaps its wings in South America, it will create a thunderstorm in Central Park in New York City. And the idea here is that a very small change in initial conditions in a chaotic system, like the weather, can produce very large results. Now you might think, if we are trying to understand a chaotic system, that we would just go out and get that butterfly. But you can't get at the butterfly. You can't find the butterfly. Even if you had the butterfly in your hand, you are not capable of knowing, of discovering what the result will be. There's a, a famous example in physics. It's called the three-body problem. And maybe this one. I'm going to try to, well, maybe it'll work, maybe it won't. The, the uh, idea of the three-body problem is if you have three planets and you want to predict their orbit, it proves to be impossible to do that. Transferring data, transferring data. Uh, because this is the peril of trying to do things live. But I like to live dangerously. I'm just like that. Uh, but maybe it'll show up, maybe it won't. <laughs> The uh, thing with the three-body problem is you cannot predict the orbits of the three planets because, of course, the gravity of one planet affects the orbit of another planet, and they each affect each other, so it's impossible to predict where they will go. This demonstration here that you see shows... Oh, that's... Shows that if you try to start it... Here we go. This is three. Well, this is one body orbiting around the other two. Bodies. You can't predict. It just goes off chaos chaotically. Anyhow, that display didn't really work. Oh well. The main point here that I'm trying to draw out is that you cannot predict when you get multiple mutually dependent variables. You create a chaotic system, and in a chaotic system. There is not a body of knowledge that you can assimilate or understand. Not a set of facts and not a set of principles or rules. It's this thinking that informed our design of the connectivism course. Instead of trying to amass a set of facts or a set of principles, instead of trying to create a curriculum or a body of knowledge, what we were more focused on was the engagement uh, by the members of the course with the material. The idea here is not to produce some set of learning, not to focus on the content, not to focus on the pedagogy, but to focus on the learner. As we said when we designed the course, the product is not a body of learning. The product is a learner. And I mean that literally. What we are attempting to do with this kind of course is to change the way people think, to change the way their brains are constructed, not to add facts to their brains, but to make them think differently. The, the content is 
simply an object of discussion. It is what they call in the field of literature a MacGuffin, something that seems really important, but really is what all of the discussion and the interaction revolves around. This leads to an alternative theory of, of, of education. In, in Canada, we have, and I guess in the United States, we have what they call the three R's, reading, writing, and arithmetic, which really makes no sense, because arithmetic starts with an A, not an R. Uh, and these are, this is an approach to learning which is characterized by a focus on the content. We are interested in a focus on the process. So we are interested in language, logic, and learning. The way a person interacts and engages with an environment. So this leads to the first theme of this presentation. And the theme is the promotion of active engagement rather than passive observation. An interaction with your environment rather than an observing of the environment. It's a bit like actor network theory, but there's no presumption of commonality. There's no presumption of translation. It's a bit like action research, but there's no presumption of a community of practice. I'll talk a little bit about that later on in the presentation. But for now, think of communities of learners interacting with each other and interacting with a body of material. And in that community, in that process, our main focus is to foster and encourage the capacity of the learner in this particular domain to think for themselves, to exercise their process, their capacity of critical thinking and reflection. The picture you should have of this model of learning is not a model where there's a person presenting a set of content like this to a, an audience like you, but rather a set of interconnected nodes here and here and here interacting with each other. So a class is not a presentation of material, a class is this conversation between these interconnected nodes. In our model, the class functions very much the way a human brain functions. And we can think of the, the teacher as being like a neuron, the student as being like a neuron. They are connected together. There are contents that go from one to the other to the other. But the main thing is not the content, not the signal that goes from one to the other to, to the other. The main thing is the connection between them. And both teaching and learning in this context consist of the sending and receiving of these signals, the interaction with other members. And it's, it's worth noting that unlike in a process like constructivism where the teacher becomes uh, more passive, like a guide by the side, to use the slogan, in this model, the teacher engages with the material every bit as much as the student. The teacher does not withdraw. The teacher becomes an active, participating part of the network. And we, that's very important because it is the connection that creates the learning, which means that the teacher has to be connected closely with the learners and working with the same material. On this model, if we were to describe the process that any individual undertakes, it's a four-part process. Aggregate, remix, repurpose, feed forward. It's almost like a slogan. I mean, do it with cheers. Aggregate to bring information in, to bring the signal in, to pull in the connection from other people. Remix, to take content or signals from one and mix it with signals from another person. Uh, that's the way uh, uh, the previous presentation was bringing in content from all kinds of different sources and movies and mixing it in with text and other presentations. To repurpose, to localize, to make the information your own, to add your own content to it, to shape it, 
And then finally, and very importantly, to feed forward, to send your new content, your new signal to the rest of the world. This four-step process describes the process of engagement in a community, engagement with an environment. On this model, notice, we are not trying to assimilate or collect content to ourselves. We're not hoarders of content. We're not memorizers of content. In our course, we told the students, there is too much content to even try to read, much less remember. We wanted them to treat the content, the information in the course, as though it were a river that you could sample as it went by, rather than a reservoir that would collect water. And, you know, our, our attitude toward a river is different from our attitude toward a re reservoir. We don't collect it, we don't store it or hoard it. With a river, we surf it, we, we sense it, we experience it but we don't try to own it. And it's a very different way of relating to content and information. This leads to the technical structure of a system that promotes this kind of learning. It's the idea of the personal learning environment, or the PLE. This diagram was created by Scott Wilson. It's a very famous diagram in the field now. And the idea is that at the center of the system is the person, is the learner, is you, right there, where it says future VLE. And then you, in the center, connect to the different parts of your environment. You connect to 43 the things. Oops. 43 things, it's backwards. Uh, which is a to-do list. You connect to Live Journal, which is your blogging tool. You connect to Flickr, which are your photographs, and so on. You connect to all of these services. You connect to content and to people on all of these services. Scott Wilson built a simple version of the personal learning environment that he called Plex. And this is a screen example of Plex. And it kind of looks like a file manager. And, and it wasn't really that popular, but people have kept working on this idea. This is something that I built. It's called My Glue, and the purpose of it is to aggregate RSS feeds, that is to say, the content of blogs and journals and other content sites, to aggregate them and mix them together and then feed them forward in a single feed to the user. Using RS or using MyGlue, I created something called RSS Writer. RSS Writer is a simple first generation, before first generation, personal learning environment. On the left hand side, you would see the aggregated resources that you can harvest from different sites. In the yellow area, you take these resources, you remix them, you edit them, you create something of your own, and then finally you feed that forward to Blogger or LiveJournal or Flickr or wherever you want, to, want the content to go. Scott Wilson built another tool called Feed Forward, makes sense, uh, again, which does the same sort of thing, except you notice that He's feeding it to any of a variety of different repositories. So a sword repository, or a blogger repository, bookmarks, Magnolia, all of these services on the internet. The idea here, you notice, is to automate our interaction with all of these services, to, to have a single personal central place to do all of these interactions. Now let me lead this into my next theme, which is, as I said at the outset, learning versus the right sort of learning. We want to foster a type of learning that is appropriate to a complex world. This is a world in which we have interdependence. This is a world in which there are no simple principles of learning, there are no simple principles of anything, there is no simple cause and effect. You cannot simply create a cause and predict an effect. 
There's no guaranteed way of making learning of some sort of learning happen. This is not because people are stupid. This is because the nature of the content to be learned is such that you cannot get at that kind of content in this way. If you think about it, the world changes. Yesterday there were nine planets, today there are eight planets. How do you teach someone the number of planets? The world is complex. It's like the weather. The weather is complex. How do you teach someone what the weather will be like two months from now? You can't teach them that. You can tell them, well, maybe, you know, we might sort of figure it out one day, but you can't have them remember as a fact what the weather will be like in the future. In this environment, all you can do is interact and exchange, you and your network of friends. Connected together, each person in this network goes through this process of aggregation, remixing, repurposing, and feeding forward. Now people talk a lot about networks, and they talk a lot about the structure of the internet. There are different ways of describing this. One way of describing this is as a tree. And this is a very common way of describing networks and the internet. This is what people like Clay Shirky talk about when they talk about power laws. They talk of, and, and this is, they talk about a network where there are central nodes of influence, where there are some people and some websites that have millions of connections and other people, uh, other websites that have only one or a few. They call this the long tail, and they act as though this is a very natural way of thinking, and it is in a certain mathematical sense. But there are other ways of building networks. An alternative type of network is a mesh network. You notice how in a mesh network there is no concentration of power and influence. You notice how in the mesh network the links are distributed. There are fewer nodes and, few, and nodes have fewer links connected together. You notice in the previous structure you have centrality, you have influence. You have very rapid transmission of ideas, very little second looking, very little uh, slowing down the transmission of something. You think of the way a rumor spreads. Rumors spread through these central sources. It's like a broadcast network, like television, like radio. On this model, we have a distributed structure. You have discussion instead of broadcasting. You have balanced point of views instead of one person having a dominant point of view. The network itself is more reflective. The network itself is more democratic. You know, there's different models of communities working together. And we, we hear a lot, and we see a lot, and even in, in today's presentation, I was saying, you know, at the top of the stairs that we saw this morning, collaboration. But there are different ways for people to work together. And I talk about an individual, a person, working with a personal learning network, and, and people make the assumption, oh, that person must be all alone. It's like they're an atom in the air or something like that. But that is not the case. When you are working in a network, you are not collaborating but you are not all alone. There's, an, there's a middle point here, there's a, uh, which can be called, say, cooperation. So you have collaboration, cooperation, individuality. The idea here is instead of individuality where everything is independent, in cooperation you are mutually dependent. Just like the planets influence each other with gravity, in cooperation you have individuals that are affected by each other. In atomism, you make your decisions along the lines of something like decision theory, or choice theory, rational logical calculation. But in cooperation, you're working much more with role models, examples, patterns that you follow. In 
cooperation, unlike collaboration, we ourselves become the story. We ourselves talk about our own perspective, our own point of view, as it has been generated by our interactions with others. It's another thesis that we have in our course. It's the therapy. It's the sharing thesis. You know, the model of education is, has always been you're either working together as a group or you're competing with each other, right? And again, there seems to be never any middle. But the middle is not competition, not collaboration, but cooperation. Cooperation through sharing, cooperation through exchange, and through conversation. It is, I would argue, the only sector, sorry, the only sustainable model of learning. You know, there's a, a second thesis that I want to draw out, a second butterfly thesis. These butterflies, you see the butterfly on this house in Canada, you see these all over in Canada. And people get these wooden butterflies and they attach them to their house. And nobody pays them to do this. There's no butterfly competition. Uh, they do it on their own, and they do it because they want to share a butterfly. You know, lots of people will say, you know, you, you have to belong to a group, or you have to be paid, or to have some incentive to share. But really, people just share naturally. That's what they do. People express themselves as individuals, and in Canada, one of the ways they express themselves is they put wooden butterflies on their house. I like that personally. And that's what generates connectivism. That's what generates the thesis that knowledge is distributed across this network of connections. It's created by this sharing that happens when people express themselves. And so learning consists not of collecting facts, but by becoming able to work and, and thrive in this kind of network, to be able to receive these signals from other people that they have shared, to be able to create and to share yourself across this network. Learning on this model is very much like becoming literate. So we return to the connectivism course that we were building. Remember, I was talking about that. So we built it out of a bunch of diverse interconnected components. One component of the course was the course Wiki. Another component of the course was the course Moodle Forum, where people would log on and make comments about whatever. Another theme Sorry, I thought I was going to another component of the course. This leads to the third theme. And this is the distinction between groups and networks. Groups are the product of collaboration. Networks are the product of cooperation. Groups are what you get when you use ordinary kinds of collaboration online. One of the things we found in the connectivism course when people went to the Moodle forum is that there was group-like behavior where some people would try to dominate the discussion and make everybody else think the same way that they did. Conversation became an exercise in propaganda. Conversation became an exercise in argumentation. That's to be compared with models where people have their own space and their own environment where conversation becomes not a matter of propaganda, not a matter of, of, of uh, argumentation, but rather a case of sharing. Each person expressing their own perspective without expecting, without trying to convince the others that this is the case. Now, Nancy White will be following very shortly, and I know it's very shortly, <laughs> uh, talks about open spaces, talks about me, we, and network, and in my mind, this is what she's talking about. She talks about objects that we care about. I talk about these objects as the medium of this conversation, 
the things that we share with other people in this network. What we are working with technologically as well as conceptually is an object system. It's a system of creating, exchanging, aggregating, and feeding forward objects. Where objects are digital artifacts that we create, just like we put butterflies on our house, we create digital artifacts that we share. What kind of artifacts? Here's an example. It's kind of a silly example. It's called a lol cat, and it's a combination of a photograph with a silly saying. Personally, I find them hilarious, because I'm a cat person. Um, the, the idea here is that people create these things, they share these things, they express themselves with law cats, with videos, with games, with photographs, with whatever they create themselves. It becomes a language of communication. So when we talk about online courses, we're talking about an entire architecture for creating for sharing, for storing, for distributing these objects. And I won't get into detail on those because it can get complicated in a hurry. You might ask, how could this possibly work? How could it work if it's all distributed, if it's all disorganized, if it's all chaotic? If you get the chance, I'll, I'll just, I don't really have time to play it, do I? No, no. Okay, yeah. Uh, if you get the chance, I'll just play this in the background. What we have here are two metronomes, and they synchronize by themselves. You see, they're started up all individually, and they're not connected to each other, right? So they just do whatever that they're like individual people in a network. Now notice there's nobody managing these, these metronomes. There's nobody controlling these metronomes. So we'll watch as this continues, so continuing, continuing. So now we'll put these metronomes on a piece of wood. And you notice that they're, they're, they're still not otherwise connected. There's still nobody managing them, but now the wood joins them. So they can send simple signals to each other. Back, signal, forth, signal. And you notice by that process, all by itself, they become synchronized. And this is what happens, this is what we see in a network, where you have separate individual things acting on their own, acting independently, acting without management, but connected, sending signals back and forth like a conversation, they become synchronized. They act individually, but they function as though they were a group. That is the middle point between collaboration, which requires management, and individualism, which is just a sort of atomism. It is that middle point that connectivist courses are attempting to achieve. This kind of self-organization is understood. We know about it. We know how it works. There are different principles by which these networks form connections with each other, and organize the way a brain organizes into thought, the way a collection of crickets in a forest ends up chirping in unison. There are different types of associative mechanisms based on different ways things are connected together, different ways connections are formed. That suggests the architecture for the grasshopper system that was used to create our connectivism course. It's an architecture, basically, of creating individual metronomes that are connected together. This architecture here describes a computer program that takes these objects in, allows somebody to create them, allows somebody to feed them forward. So here's an actual screenshot where somebody can create a page that will be shared Here's a screenshot of a feed management system. The idea of the feed management system is we're listing the RSS feeds that we are going to aggregate and connect with. 
We map these feeds into our own system. Different feeds are organized in different ways. And that allows us to create the course components. Course components like the daily. This daily newsletter that we gave to everybody in the course every day, last year, 2,200 people in our course, they each received this daily. This daily newsletter is the same as OL Daily. It, what it does is it collects resources that were created by people in the course, brings them together, collects them, and then sends them out to people in the course. So it's sort of like the centralized component of the course. These <coughs> links here that you see on this slide, each of these is an individual separate website created by a student in the course. We had 170 separate websites that were created by course members uh, last year. There's a fewer number this year, about 40 or 50. And every day we harvest the contents of those. This is a course map. It shows the organization of the course. This course map was created by one of the students. We didn't provide one because, well, we're like that. Uh, this course map shows that the structure of our course is like the structure of a mesh, of, of a mesh network. So the organization in the course is like the synchronous organization of the metronomes. Okay, so they're telling me I have to finish so I'm just going to wrap up now with about one or two sentences and say that the technology of the future is leading toward this. We've seen in the past a lot of technology oriented toward collaborative work online, but the new technology that we are seeing and learning is oriented more toward personal learning, individuals learning, and connected with each other. And so we have the personal <coughs> learning center with autonomous learning. So I thank you very much for your time. <laughs>